Reactive training systems. Hey, welcome back to the RTS podcast. Today I talked to Dr. Jordan Fagenbaum of Barbell Medicine. And it's a really great conversation. I think you're really going to enjoy it. You're going to take a lot away from it. Uh, our conversation goes, I would characterize it as something uh, about general programming, general training um, topics, um, BS detection, uh, things like that. But then I would say the real uh, meat of the conversation, at least for me, uh, was a discussion on uh, I guess Jordan and Barbell Medicine's uh, interpretation of current uh, pain science. And he does mention uh, in the podcast, and I think it's a good point to bring up, that it's not their thing. Like this is this is the direction that pain science in general is going in. Uh, this is this is their reading of the research, and uh, it seems to be the pain science community's direction overall currently. And we talk about ways that that applies to powerlifting, powerlifting coaching, um, things that you should be aware of if you're uh, not a doctor, uh, but a powerlifting coach or a strength coach. Uh, we also talk about, um, I guess I would characterize it as, as some challenges to uh, to his ideal or uh, to the positions that he takes on regarding uh, pain and technical coaching, whether or not you should worry about technique uh, as a lifter, and how that fits in with um, with some of the ideas that I've been uh, talking about more recently uh, with regard to self-organized technique and, and things along those lines. So uh, that's kind of all the preamble that I'll, that I'll give it. I'll get right into the uh, discussion here. Um, I hope you really enjoy it. I know that I had a great time. Uh, and again, it's Dr. Jordan Fagamom of Barbell Medicine. Uh, he gives his uh, contact information at the end, but uh, it boils down to if you search for Barbell Medicine uh, in places that you would think to search, like Google or YouTube or Instagram, uh, that you would, you'll find what you're looking for. So here we go. Here's the conversation. Thanks. For me, like that's kind of where a lot of this stuff started was like back in the day, we'd you just have conversations with people, you know, that's kind of how it went, you know, and, and I remember having conversations with other lifters and, and feeling like I got a, a lot out of it, you know, not just in the nuts and bolts things, but just understanding how people think, stuff like that. Uh, that yeah. was really useful for me. And I don't know when podcasting came along, it was like, oh, this would be a great way to let other people kind of participate in that. So, yeah. 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 yeah it's a, uh, well, so, but now it's like, everyone's got these questions, right? It's like, and you're just peppering you, but you don't, and you don't get to do that till after the fact you have to like go back and listen to your own podcast. And then you're like, Oh man, I wish that I would have thought about, you know, I should have asked this, but I wasn't even listening. I was just trying to get through all the questions I had written. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it's uh, it is, I agree. So, well, you started lifting your, what was your first competition? Do you remember like your first year? Like I did this, uh, I don't know. It was a squat and bench meet in high school. It was not a, it, okay. it was just like some football coach put it on and invited like all the area schools. Yeah. Well, you're in Texas, you were in Texas, <laughs> right? Like originally? No, no. I was in Indiana. Oh, uh, it's the same. Like whatever. <laughs> no, well, so so we're the same age. Uh, I think so. Um, that was what, like two thousand and one or two. Yeah, yeah. There right was there. nothing on the internet, right? So like, you couldn't like email somebody to be like, if you had an email address, like you were ahead of the time, right? You couldn't email somebody and be like, hey, what program do you think I should run? You had Deep Squatter, right? And then you had like, you know, Muscle and Fiction. I guess Power Magazine was still going on back then, but I wasn't far enough into the sport to even know that that existed until after it had already like stopped being published. So yeah, man, I, I found uh, uh, well before we even had internet in my house, uh, <laughs> uh, my dad had it at work, and I remember he like printed off some articles uh, off of Dave Draper's website, you know. Oh, yeah. but, 
And, uh, I mean, that's kind of what I had to go on in the early days. And then, uh, Dr. Squat's website was pretty early on and, uh, had a message board there, but still like, it's just, I don't know. It's different from the way that it used to be in a lot of ways, you know, just the amount of access, but then I I don't know. There's a lot of difference. And I mean, I, I know that I, a lot of times can kind of come off as being like back in my day, things were, things were different. (laughs) (laughs) But no, I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan of how the sport has evolved. You know, I think powerlifting is, is better than it used to be. Uh, I think it's, I don't know. I'm, I have fun doing this and I like, I like that it's enjoyable. (laughs) Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, yeah, it's even hard to compare the two sports. Like one now has like, what is it, 30,000 members, you know, at least in the USAPL compared to like 1,200 when I went to the first Raw Nationals. Like there was like, you know, nobody participated. The But, you know, with that like massive overwhelming benefits to the sport, there's also like this kind of, yeah, I don't know. I feel the same way. Like uh, like this old like, person, you know, get off my lawn, but you know, it's like, you know, you, these questions are like, what is the most optimal way to like train this particular like thing, like which is way out. It's not that it's a bad question. It's just like, you know, there's time and a place for the question. And that particular question sure. is years down the line, you know. Uh, yeah. And there's, there's these other questions that like my favorite is why am I doing – sets of six instead of sets of seven or sets of five sure sure (laughs) the forbidden sets of five i know but (laughs) well well, that's yeah i mean but that's some people will make a a case for like why fives and it's like why not fours yeah i mean the first program you ever wrote for me was had fours on all like the competition lifts and Mm -hmm. i remember i got this i was in europe at the time and i was like what the hell is this rolling me (laughs) Like, but, but come to find out that, you know, it's probably a little bit more specific towards power. I mean, a little bit. And then, you know, if you're used to doing fives all the time and then you start doing fours, well, now the intra set fatigue becomes less of a concern because you're like, I only got to do four reps. And so you get to, yeah. Anyway, it was, I remember reading, I go, "Ah, he messed up. This is a mistake. (laughs) (laughs) And, And I mean, like I can appreciate it at the same time because like that's those are the same questions that I had in the beginning, sure. you know, and and I know what it's like to have that question. But at the same time, now I feel like I understand it better. And I hope what I have is something approaching an answer. But it's it's not like a, a one liner. You know, it's not even like a one pager. Like it's it's a deeper question. And it's the answer is probably not. A satisfying one you right. know yes that, yeah well so like all right so someone comes we're let's say you and i are on a q a panel together mm-hmm. the internet will love this be like uh what rep you know scheme is best for strength improvement fours fives or sixes <laughs> you know and so then 45 minutes later, after we've mm-hmm. hemmed and hawed about, you know, strength is specific and how are you measuring this and what is your what goals or what are your outcomes are you actually testing and what is your training history? Like you just go through all these things, like all these contextual factors that make it, you know, the, yeah. the, give the give you some sort of background. And then you say, eh, it probably doesn't really matter, to be honest. I mean, from like a, you know, development kind of thing, unless you have a clear preference towards one rep range or you know, historical evidence that suggests you over respond or under respond to one of those extremes. But if you don't, then it's kind of like, I don't know. Yeah, right. Right. And then people are like, no, that's not the, I need an answer. <laughs> Give me an answer. No, it's the, the uncomfortability with uncertainty, which again, man, I got that too. It's just that after a certain point, I think you just start to go, well, crap, I can either pretend that there's an answer or I can say, well, I actually don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's, that has been the, after the cult deprogramming occurred after leaving. (laughs) Well, seriously though, I mean, you think I, I would say two years ago, I was much more comfortable 
giving discrete answers to questions that now I don't think actually have, you know, firm answers. So, uh, but anyway, so after this, like the deprogramming had occurred, now we get quite very similar questions and it's just longer answers with less sort of certainty. And I think actually from a business standpoint, it's interesting that that's probably less desirable for a certain part of the market. They want you to tell them with confidence and say it with your chest. So yeah. like rather, rather than be like, mm, yeah, it kind of doesn't matter. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I could totally relate to that too, man. Like that's, I, uh, it makes sense like this desire for certainty. And especially if you're going to frame someone as some kind of expert, you know, sure. it's, it makes sense that an expert should have the answer, right? Well, mm -hmm. eh, it turns out it's not really a math problem, you know? Well, we're not machines, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. It's more complicated. And then I think that the, the public, the, there's two issues. One is not, if someone doesn't have a mental model to be comfortable with the uncertainty, like you alluded to earlier, like, then they're like, well, this person just doesn't know what the hell they're talking about. They're not an expert. Uh, or, or if the person um, can't sort of grasp uh, uh, that maybe they're asking the wrong question in the first place, then they just think, well, they're, they're dismissive. They're not even giving me the information. So they're not, again, it leads to the same point. They're not an expert. And then they'll go find their information from somewhere else, both of which are frustrating because yeah. you, you're trying to provide high quality information, but you, you, we don't have enough time to sit down with everybody and sort of, you know, <laughs> show them, show them the way. I mean, when did, do you remember when you published your book, the RTS manual? Like how long ago was that? It's uh, 2008. 2008. So, it, and you haven't updated it yet. Right. I assume that this is like, uh, it like it sits on like a to do list that you just yeah, like you're remake. Poking, you're poking me in the sore spot here, Jordan. No, no, I'm, just, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Yeah. Well, the the problem, the task is so monument. It, it's huge, right? There's so many different components. You're like, I want to expand all these things and try to provide better information for people. But then you're like, start unpacking these ideas, and you're like, oh my god, like where do I even go? You know. So, but then if someone asks you, hey, is the book worth getting, and you're like. You know, yeah, it's got good information in it. It's just, I think that I would change my opinion on some things and add more, you know, information to different places to make it clearer. But you're trying to impart like, you know, not only 15 years of training knowledge and coaching knowledge, but then also like all of the things you've absorbed from other people and other resources into like a text. It's like, well, that's a good point. Actually, I think it, if I had to summarize because i've looked you're right i've looked at like an outline of what a revision would look like and there's a lot of stuff that is definitely new it would qualify as new but there's a lot of stuff that would just it would add a lot of uns, not uncertainty but less prescriptive things sure. you know so like there's a there's a number of different templates uh, like not full programs, but like weekly templates that are outlined in, in the book. And I probably wouldn't do that because why those two, you know, why not the infinity other <laughs> templates that are available, right? Well, I, I just want to get the program, Mike. That's why I bought the book. Come on know, now. Right? What yeah. is the RTS program? You're like, yeah. ah. <laughs> See, that's the, that's the thing too, right? Like from a commercial standpoint, you kind of need to do that. Uh, yeah. And I'm on the fence about, like I, I'm okay with examples and stuff like that, but part of me gets uncomfortable with providing something that can be like interpreted as the answer, you know? Sure. And I'll probably just do what I always do is have like a page and a half of disclaimers about what I'm not actually saying, you know? Right, right. Well, that's, I mean, so I just finished, uh, I, last time we talked, which was, it might've been a year ago on, on my podcast. Uh, shout out to Barbell Medicine Podcast. No, um, <laughs> <laughs> my own shameless plug. Well, we were talking about like a novice program, which yeah. this idea has been like rattling around in my head for a long time and like what to do. And so first I'm not calling it a novice program anymore. It's a beginner's like template, but the I had to, I, I wrote, I started with the program and writing the program, like trying to distill this down ended up being like this huge, like task where I'm like, oh, Okay, like I'm just gonna pick this because people want an example, and then I realized, well, I, this needs to be an accompanying text with this like 
template. And then the text is effectively like all the caveats and rationale for like why I'm making these decisions and how you could potentially interpret that a different way or try a different way based on outcomes you feel like impor- are important and your response, et cetera, et cetera, expectations. And uh, so anyway, the the template is this big, but the explanation is this big and it ends up, yeah, it's um, it's very difficult to to do just the here's the recommendation and feel good about that yeah you know you have to you almost have to have it paired with like multiple things to give people the tools but on the other hand it, you, you don't want to do the super training thing and just write a book and then like <laughs> there's nothing like there's no practical implementation of it anywhere for like you know it, yeah it, you're caught because you don't want people to turn to the last page and just oh there's the program cool like you don't want people to do that but at the same time you don't want them to get to the last page and be like, okay, I still have no idea how this actually looks like, well, please help. I wonder if it's a scope problem because I, yeah, I like think it's too big. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Like I think super training tries to be like the training book for anybody who is physical in any way. And <laughs> right. that's, you're biting off a lot, yeah. you know, it have been in, like, in a series of encyclopedias like broken up by, you know, different yeah. modalities or, you know, something. Yeah. yeah. Have you have you gone back? Like I haven't. I'll be honest. I haven't looked at my copy in years at this point. But I wonder if my my improved understanding of just the training the training process. I guess I wonder if that helps as far as understanding what the hell is going on in that book. <laughs> well, last time I last time I remember opening it and reading like any dedicated thing was it was three years ago. And only because I was moving and I was like, do I really want to take this book? And then I ended up on the toilet, like going through a few pages. And, and I think, and this also happened, to, I did reread um, uh, both of Isserin's text on block periodization just to kind of like see if, yeah, same sort of thing. If I kind of figured out any more info no, with the, with, with better, with better uh, knowledge base. With uh, what I would describe as a more expanded knowledge base, I'm better at like, Hmm, well, they're probably mean this. And so that makes sense. And I'm just trying to fit what, you know, this bad grammar, <laughs> poor grammar, rather. I'm trying to fit that into my existing mental model. So I actually have no idea if Sif and Tetsuorsky were trying to like say what I think they're saying. But uh, for all the listeners out there, I, I don't think I would recommend super training to I because I, I I can't make heads or tails of it. I would recommend uh, that Siorski's second edition of, uh, was it science and principles of strength and conditioning is a much more accessible text to me. Cause I've, and so after reading that, I was like, well, is, was Sif high the whole time? <laughs> <laughs> like just, and I, you know, I'm not trying to, to poke fun at the, at the, at the dead guy. It's just, I, I, to answer your question, I don't actually think I have a better understanding of that book now than I used to. I just, uh, maybe no more. And like, I'm okay with like fitting that into my existing knowledge base. I don't know. That's a good point. I didn't really think of that, but that would be something that you'd have to be on guard for. Yeah. yeah. It's like, it's like, oh, this is my current understanding. So I'm going to read this passage that makes no sense on its own, but yeah. then ah, I'll just fit this in this little, little nook right here. That makes sense. It's kind of the, uh, uh, I don't know what these, the textbook equivalent of cherry picking, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, and, and again, I, I think I don't know the publication date for that book, but yeah, me either. Yeah, let's assume it, I mean, nineties, like you feel like that's a fair assumption, I guess. Yeah. All right. At well, least you know, it, we're on the internet. So. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was at least the nineties. Cause I, I remember, or at least the late nineties, because I remember that when what really? Yeah, ninety nine. So says Google. The Google machine says ninety nine. All right. So so just think about think about trying to let's say that you had started your lifting career much earlier, like you were older, whatever. Yeah. And you had to write your first volume of the RTS manual in ninety eight or ninety nine. Like, I think that task would that would have been way harder. There's just there was less. There were less resources already out. The understanding, like from a scientific fundamental standpoint in the United States, especially, was not even close to where it was in 2008. So, I mean, maybe we got to, you know, 
give Sif and Zatsyorsky a little a little leeway here because we're trying to write that thing in in the year they yeah. do. I don't know, man. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't like you said. It's not not so much about poo pooing on their work or anything. It's, I mean, it is what it is. It's just that it's not directly prescriptive for somebody like me, at least. Sure. Um, which I mean, it's funny how the perceptions of that book have, have kind of changed over the years. Cause for a while it was like the Bible of training. At least that's how people in the community talked about it. Yeah, and then well, you're smart only if you're smart though. Right. Yeah. The, the, this is the understanding and you have to read this. And when you understand it, then you will understand you'll be enlightened, you know? Right. Right. Um, but then it's kind of gone the other way. And and more or less stayed there. <laughs> yeah, I would say in like the last ten or fifteen years, like it, it went through this period, this initial period where it was the book, and then now it's like, eh, nobody nobody understands, you know. And, yeah, I think people are okay with saying that now. Like before, people are like, yeah, I read this book. It's obviously way above my level, or it doesn't make sense. One of the two things, or potentially both. <laughs> and then, uh, and but then they would say, yeah, I read it, and it's. It's really good, man, because they weren't comfortable saying, I actually didn't really understand anything or how to apply any of those principles to my, whatever my specific sort of niche is. And now people like will read, you know, the first third of it and be like, dude, I don't, I have to give up. I don't know. I need another book like yeah. this. Is, yeah. And then, so maybe, maybe people are just more comfortable admitting that they have no idea what's going on in there. I'm fine with saying it. Like, yeah, I, I will say the, so two pieces of credit that I should give. Uh, One is um, for me, a lot of the genesis of RPE came from uh, came. So my introduction to what RPE was in a classical sense came from that book. Uh, And then, so like, okay, so here's a concept of what RPE is, but then I paired it with all this other stuff that, um, I have been coming across during this time about like uh, leave a rep in the tank. And like, that was the thing that people were doing there, right? Like don't, don't train to hard failure on every set, leave a rep in the tank, you know? And I thought, well, you could leave two reps in the tank, you three reps in the tank and, you know, kind of doing the, the Ricky Bobby. <laughs> I was say, I was like, you, want to eat, you can't just leave one. You, if you're not right. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But uh, so it was like, okay, we can, you know, attach an effort scale to that. So that was kind of the introduction there. And and I will say I've gotten, I think it's, it's good, maybe idea generation. Cause I, I think that there's a, a big risk in, in what you're saying, just the, the tendency to fit vague statements to our current understanding of the world, the Nostradamus yeah. effect or whatever. Yeah. I mean, that's, yeah, that happens all the time. Like yeah. it's literally like the huge, one of the largest sources of bias and uh, sort of like cognitive biases that people undergo because you can't not do that. Like you'd have uh, with, uh, without taking special care to be like, Oh, I'm just actually like projecting these things on this, what should be neutral information. Right. So like, yeah, it'd be really hard to like do this subconsciously, you know, to, to, to eliminate that, that bias of all your previous experiences and learning. And if you can do that without like making con, con you know, concerted efforts, like ah, tell me how, like I want right. to know because every, even every time I read a paper, it's the same deal. So same thing with reading super training, except less, again, less useful for, for me. I mean, I, I, I don't know, perhaps if my IQ was 20 points higher. <laughs> like, well, so that's the, the, piece about cognitive biases, I think is interesting too. I I wonder, so we know that these cognitive biases exist and I like to consider like why they're there, you know, like context in which those types of biases are useful, even, even better than not having them, you know, and, and it seems at least in my own, uh, brain work it seems like a lot of times it comes back to like speed of processing and things of that things like that like if you assume that you've got 
a lot of, uh, I guess, contextual experience in common with the person communicating information with you, then that's probably, that probably helps. Uh, but if you don't, you know, if you are coming, uh, coming up against this, like you said, a field of neutral information, then assuming, uh, probably makes things quite a bit worse. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that it would be really difficult to like interact with the world in a way where you didn't automatically apply these like I'll just call them filters, like like bias yeah, filters, yeah. It, because your speed of processing would be so slow. It'd be like trying to, you know, watch YouTube with the dial up modem. So you almost have to. I mean, it, it it's I'm using the wrong term because it's not. I mean, chunking. I've typically you know, we typically apply that to like how athletes, you know, group or or, or people playing doing a specific task, like will group certain things together so they recognize and process things faster. But like. I, this happens in everyday life, you know, stereotyping, uh, you know, pre, you're basically it's like a Bayesian predictive sort of thing. Right. Like, so you have to, you're applying filters to all sorts of things nonstop consistently. Um, so with information, I think imagine trying to read an academic text or journal article. And every step of the way, every line that you read, every assertion that you read, you're you read it, you take it in, you go, mm, I feel this way about, no, I have to remove, I got to peel that back and then I got to read it again and reinterpret. It's like, you couldn't function that way. So I think, you know, yeah, we, we always have to make this concerted effort to like assess what our own bias is. Yeah. And that goes back to even to training too. Like if you sent me a trash program, Right. And I assessed, I thought it was junk because I didn't like certain elements of it or whatever. It didn't make sense to me, you know, whatever. Then my outcomes would likely be compromised unless I could remove that bias, you know. And I'm sure you fight with athletes all the time, not fight like fisticuffs or like, <laughs> you know, call them names or whatever. But we'll go back and forth like, well, hey, why don't you like these things? Or why, what is your resistance to trying these things? If you're not open to doing that, you probably just say, yeah, that's cool. We'll do something else, you know, after after one or two back and forths. But trying to find out where those biases exist, even in training is, yeah, I, I, I agree. It's super interesting. I wish I had a better way to tell myself how to turn it off or had yeah. more insight into why, but I don't. I just know that it exists and I'm, therefore a biased human like everyone else. Yeah. Have you by chance read the happiness hypothesis? The happiness hypo No, I'm thinking of the happiness advantage, which I think is a fluffier book. <laughs> well, the, honestly, the, I think the happiness hypothesis is a bit of a, a misnomer, but um, I read this book several years ago and really enjoyed it. Uh, one of the things that, um, I think it came from this book because we're talking about this particular cognitive bias, right? Sure. And uh, basically projecting your own emotional response onto a field of information uh, to make a decision, right? Right. And uh, uh, since logic and reason are clearly superior in every way imaginable, uh, then that's how we should aspire to, to make decisions. Well, I th again, I think it was in this book. Maybe I'm mistaken, but uh, I read an anecdote about uh, a particular group of people who have a specific kind of brain damage that's damaged their uh, like emotional centers of their brain. So they tend not to have this problem, right? Oh, so okay. you'd think, hey, awesome. You could make every decision like super logically. You know, it would only only logical decisions coming from this guy. It yeah, turns out it's extraordinarily debilitating, <laughs> you know, yeah, like, yeah. hey, do you want to wear pants today or shorts? Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, all the factors that go into that uh, decision, you know, well, we have to, you know, list them all out and try to weight them appropriately. Like, just pick one and let's move on with our lives. Right. Like, right. And I think wrap this around to the, you know, sets of four or five or six conversation. Like, I think there's a lot of that type of, I, I guess I'm just going to call it inductive reasoning for lack of a better term. Sure. Um, that happens 
like those types of judgment calls are, you know, inductive, they're intuitive a lot of times, you know, and it's based on experience. It's based on, you know, sometimes it's based on specific things, but a lot of times it's not, you know? Yeah. And I mean, it does come from somewhere and it is a learning process. It's not like, it's not the same as random choice, you sure. know, but, but it's, uh, it's also not explicitly rational. You know? Right. Yeah. I mean, if there was a large data set suggesting that people in, who go to powerlifting meets, who in the majority of their training did fours, did significantly better than people who did fives, and there were no outliers, then right. cool. Evidence-based training. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but we don't have that. And so, yeah, a lot of the stuff, when the differences are, we estimate to be small or maybe even non like no, no real difference other than, you know, some arbitrary thing that we're making up. Like what's the real difference between four reps and five reps besides, <laughs> right. No repetition, right. Um, then you have to, you kind of, you're using this sort of uh, outcome based assessment. So does somebody do better or worse? And like, you're trying to weed break, the, you know, uh, sift through the noise for all the things that go into like performance. But yeah, to, to wrap it back to the four to six rep range, I mean, my take on it right now is that it probably doesn't matter outside of how it affects compliance or individual training differences. Yeah. But would I get more hypertrophy with sets of six? I'm like, I mean, if you do more sets of six, maybe, you know, maybe, <laughs> but, yeah. but, you know, then uh, you're, you're talking about different variables. So yeah, yeah I okay. don't know. And a lot of times those come from the place of the wrong, asking the wrong question too, because it's 100%. not, it's not even as much about what's going to give you the best hypertrophy in the next three to six weeks. It's, you know, that's completely insignificant. What we're really asking is, you know, three to five years probably. And if we're talking about that type of time frame, then you're not going to marry just one of those anyway. So yeah. Yes. Well, so that's no, a, I think that's I, as close as I can personally get to a concrete answer. <laughs> yeah, well, you, <laughs> have to decide. Answer. you have to decide. You have to be on one side or the other. If you're not, then you don't know. Uh, you're not, not I, don't know right? I mean, you can't you can't write a book around, you know, without without branding a certain rep range. So I think <laughs> that you should be the fours guy. Like the five <laughs> things already taken. Just you could be the guy who does fours. I think Doug Hepburn used to do a lot of fours. I, I remember one of his old programs was like fours, just like tons. Of, and I was like, it seems so strange. Why would you do fours? And I, so I used to, I used to write programs. Uh, it's a lot less now, but I used to write a lot of programs that would have like sevens or nines yeah. or elevens. You know? Yeah. My first program was like fours for the for the two major exercise like yeah. and sevens and then at the end of the week i like i was 11s and i was like this guy no like his keyboard's broken <laughs> he's, he's sending me those are the only buttons that work right <laughs> <laughs> he's trolling me yeah no it was there were like lengthy conversations about like why i would pick 11 or nine you know versus you know why nine why not eight why not ten eight or ten those are common why nine that's just such an odd thing and i mean tr the the truth of the matter was my thinking was more to the tune of like i want you to work with a 10 rep max weight and leave a rep in the tank so that's nine reps you know sure. um so that I mean, that's just the way my brain was wired at the time now I, I don't, I decided I didn't like the, the kind of mental waylay it was putting on people. So, so I kind of got away from that. Um, but I, mean, it, I don't think it's like a, that, that was the reason I got away from it too. It wasn't that, Oh wait, nine, I could just be doing 10 and that would be so much better. Yeah. It's not, not that so much, you know? Yeah. I, it's funny now. I almost prefer strange rep ranges. Like I prefer fours now compared, not, not because I think I get a markedly better training response, but just because I know what my five RM is. And so four at nine is a pretty easy thing. I can like, I know what my goal is for a given movement, you know, just now on my train for as far as training history goes. So, but yeah, people do, I get the same questions. Why are you picking this, you know, 
I had 13s. I put 13s in somebody's book. <laughs> and I knew as soon as I wrote it, like, uh, you know, people will lose their mind. Or like a mile rep set. I was like, you should be getting somewhere between, you know, 13 and 18 rep, like depending on what the load that you choose and how accurate you are. And they're like, oh my gosh, but, but why is there such a big range? And I'm like, well, there are many things that are going to go into your performance on this given like task, right? Like if yeah. you're not very well conditioned, like from a strength endurance perspective, you might, you might do 13 reps at the same like relative intensity that I would do 18 reps in if I was in shape at the time. Uh, so anyway, yeah. yeah. So people, people are uncomfortable with things maybe that they haven't experienced before, or especially if they're like vested in some arbitrary, you know, notion of, 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 uh, or an arbitrary rep range in this particular case. Sure. So uh, like people coming from starting strength, right? They're like fives. It's all fives. It's hyper specialized. You got four movements, one rep range, that's it. And if you read that book and then you, you know, were in that sort of, uh, like community, then you've like given this some level of, uh, you know, authority in your training sort of, uh, uh, life. And, and so if somebody's like challenging that even like indirectly by saying, no, nah, we're going to do some fours or like sixes or like, <laughs> and different and exercise variation, then there's like, even if it's not something you're conscious of, there's a little, mm, it yeah. doesn't feel, this doesn't feel like it's something I'm comfortable with. And it's like, yeah, well, it's really your fault, but how do we get through this together? <laughs> Man, okay. So I've, I feel like I've uh, taken us in this weird direction, <laughs> really, oh, yeah. really, really focusing on reps here, but um, th that's fine. I, you know. <laughs> I had some things I wanted to get off my chest. So there, yeah, we go. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I do. I do. I feel like we got that, got that, got through that one. Okay. But I do have something I wanted to, to kind of pick your brain about more specifically. So you, you mentioned the barbell medicine podcast Yeah, and it's something that I listen to. So oh, I, I listen to, to you guys, uh, uh, talk about, well, all, all the subjects that you guys cover, but the thing in particular, I wanted to, chat a little bit about today was in particular your thoughts about um, your pain and, and rehab. So maybe if we could start with uh, a brief summary on kind of what your thoughts are. Now, I know that you've done like multiple hours of podcasting on this topic and asking you to do a brief summary on it. It's kind of a dick move, but yeah, <laughs> yet, thanks, Mike. <laughs> yet here I am. <laughs> yeah, here we are. But, I mean, I, I guess what I'm getting at is I, if we cover it somewhat briefly, if, if anybody listening finds that it's insufficient, then you've got a lot of resources out there already that go into a lot more depth on it. Sure. Uh, and then we can, I, I can ask you some hopefully not stupid questions about it. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Yeah. So I will fully admit that whatever I can come up with in the next three or four minutes is going to be insufficient for understanding this huge field of pain and rehab, but I hopefully give people like a primer that lets them kind of participate and active listening in the rest of this podcast. So um, prior to the this sort of, well, previously in the medical community, the biomedical model was the overwhelming model that doctors, physical therapists, athletic trainers, everybody used for managing um, all diseases, diseases of every state, of every kind, including injury. And so that model would say there is something biologically wrong. So in the case of an injury like tissue damage or a mechanical problem with the joint, you know, something going on if you had joint pain. And uh, that's what you had to fix in order to improve pain. Th that has been displaced by the biopsychosocial model for pain, which means that there are biological factors, psychological factors, social factors that all go into the sort of pain experience. And each each issue, each injury, will say uh, ha it's like a it's like a pie chart would have different level, different contributions from the biological, psychological, and social components. So for instance, a compound fracture of the femur, very large biological component to that pain experience, okay? Whereas low back, nonspecific low back pain, which most people 
if that's what they're experiencing from training, okay, actually has very low biological sort of inputs. Rather, the psychological inputs and social inputs are very, very robust in that particular uh, instance. So for instance, if your parents had low back pain when you were growing up and that debilitated them, your expectation is that, oh my gosh, this I have the potential to be, you know, <laughs> in, in a lot of pain and I have to be on a couch horizontally and do this, you know, heat, ice, heat, ice, all this other stuff, rub CBD oil on there, like a CBD suppository. Like that's what I have to do to get better. Um, so just from a social learning perspective, if you're, uh, uh, and then there's just a, uh, if your doctor says, yeah, I think because you're lifting your, these heavy weights, you actually hurt your back. Well, they just no SIBO you. It's not it's the opposite of placebo. So again, there's these psychosocial inputs into that actual pain experience and a very low biological input into that experience. So with that out of the way, uh, the current definition we use for injury is from a British Journal of Sports Medicine. Uh, the author is Timka. And we reference this a lot. It's an injury is something that where there is uh, a acute loss in performance uh, with uh, plus or minus a deformity. So some sort of morphological like deformity. So again, compound fracture of the femur, there's your deformity and loss of function. Um, there, if you just have a loss of function, that still is an injury, even if there's no deformity, but it's a spectrum, right? So like DOMS is on that spectrum. So DOMS is technically an injury state, right? But it's very, it's, you're not losing a ton of function. So are you really injured? Yeah, it's actually really difficult in the pain science world to actually define what is an injury, like where's the cutoff. So again, and again, there are psychosocial components that go into that somebody you with DOMS, you're like, yeah, it's fine. I'm still going to train. But you know, somebody who's never trained before, maybe who thought that they, maybe if they have fibromyalgia and their sort of social cues and psych psychological standpoint, if they get sore, they're like, I'm debilitated right now. And so that's a different, that's a different deal. So maybe they are injured, even though you guys have the same biological milieu second right. uh, from Dom. So all that is to say injury is super hard to define. There are biological, psychological, and social inputs into the pain experience that, that stems from um, any sort of insult and that is the prevailing uh, sort of model for understanding pain and injury in pain science today. Suggesting that if you are on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, and somebody's like, you know, really talking about anytime you have low back pain, there's micro tears or trauma or whatever, you know, they're really trying to sell you on this structure damage or tissue damage equals dysfunction equals pain that they're using outdated rebutted, thoroughly discredited information. And it doesn't mean that they're bad people. So you don't like go comment like, yeah, jackass, stop doing it. It's like, <laughs> it's just that, that we've moved past that, like far past that. And I think, and then I would encourage people to go consume information on, on this topic. The best book that I can recommend is called Explain Your Pain Supercharged by uh, Laura Murr Mosley. It's a great text. Um, and then we have tons of podcasts and articles about this stuff. But anyway, I don't know how many minutes that was, but hopefully that sets this up. Somewhere. Yeah, man, I, I think I think that's awesome. So um, to to maybe point us in a little bit more uh, specific direction. So if if pain, let's see how 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 to set this up. So if if pain is is at times, uh, not necessarily uh, a result of damaged tissue. Yeah, often, um, often, in fact, I would argue, particularly in a training context. All right, all right. I, what role do you see then uh, for coaching and correcting uh, technique? Because that's where a lot of this stuff comes back, right? Like it, it's Perfect. like, hey lift like this so that you don't get hurt yes you know? yeah so we actually yeah we talk about this yeah. all the time and, and the idea so the first problem i have is that people putting that out there who are in positions of 
power or authority say, hey, don't lift like this or you'll get hurt, that is a big nocebo. So effectively what you've done is you've conditioned somebody to expect that if they have a form deviation that they will in fact become injured and have pain. So for instance, if I got on Instagram every day and told people, hey, if your knees cave in in the squat, you're gonna have medial knee pain, secondary to medial meniscus damage, not which is not true by the way, but let's say I said that, well, I would be conditioning anybody who never noticed that their knees came in to have medial knee pain and that's social learning. I've conditioned them. I've primed them to have that. As far as what role does technique, a quote unquote, good technique, whatever that means, <laughs> I, I think for, you know, you'd have to come to an agreement about what good technique actually is, right? And so I think from a performance standpoint, this is actually much easier because you're like, it is the one that allows the lifter to lift the most weight in a given set of constraints <laughs> repeatedly and right. efficiently, you know, whatever. But if that involves thoracic rounding in the deadlift, is that bad? Is that, you know, I, and I, I not, nobody has the answer to that. You know, um, basically I don't think that coaching technique outside of improved efficiency and encouraging people to, sort of have this, I guess, decreased sensitization to technique, what, what they might perceive as technique flaws. I think those are the two roles of, for coaching. So you're, you're trying to get somebody to move better so they lift more weight, presumably because they care about their performance. Otherwise, they wouldn't be talking to you or I. Right. And, and you'd also like them to be able to repeatedly use a similar technique over time so that way they can engage in progressive overload in a you know, somewhat sustainable manner. So from a performance standpoint, cool. I think we can agree on that. Agree on that. And then, but at the same time, you don't want to be overzealous about you have to do it this way, right? Perfection, creating this, fostering this sort of culture of perfectionism. And if you do anything wrong, that's bad. And if, and you don't give people the consequence, like you're going to get hurt. Because what first, that's not evidence-based. Like, please, where, where are the studies? Where, you know, where are the studies suggesting that people who pull in lumbar flexion, you know, have more nonspecific low back pain than people who pull in perfect extension or people whose knee have, have valgus moments at the bottom of a squad have more knee pain like that. That stuff doesn't exist. And, you know, anecdotally, you and I both know people who have who have technique flaws who seemingly, for whatever reason, are, are rarely injured, whereas other people who are like really on their technique game are more injured than not that doesn't always hold but it's it it happens enough where you're like maybe i question this relationship and i and i think what you're what you find here is that people who sometimes have technique issues are probably a little more laissez-faire about you know does this actually mean anything they're like well sure it's not the most efficient way to lift weights but you know i'm not killing myself whereas the person who's like my technique has to be perfect every single rep otherwise it's actually an rpe 10 by definition and you know so then any deviation they they perceive that they're likely to have more pain or a potential injury because that's that's their mental model they don't have another mental model so i'm giving you this additional mental model that suggests hey if your knees slide forward in the bottom of the squat if your knees cave in at the bottom of the squat if your background's on a deadlift it's not the end of the world it might be less efficient you know but you're not causing this acute, severe tissue damage that is going to reliably result in a pain experience. You know, that's that's not how this works um, unless you expect that to happen. Um, the biggest predictors that we have for people, you know, having pain um, is that they're undertrained to begin with, weak, like specifically like strength. And then two, the acute uh, on chronic workload has been ramped up too quickly, meaning their acute training stress or environmental stress plus training stress has ramped up too quickly for what they've previously been exposed to and adapted to. So notice in there, I didn't say like, yeah, dude, if your technique is like not pristine, like that's, uh, that's a problem. We don't have evidence on that. We only have evidence to the contrary. So it's not just an absence of evidence. It's, there's evidence of absence there. Yeah. I, I, I think though, from a performance standpoint and then, you know, and progressive overload standpoint, and then again, just encouraging people that it's okay if your technique's not perfect yet. I don't expect it to be perfect in the first year of training. Like it's gonna get better and then you're gonna keep working on it your entire career. Like when you go to squat, or your front squat now is, you know, you've been only you've been front squatting for what, a couple of years, two years yeah. now? Yeah. yeah. And so 
there's still things that you're thinking about. But wait, you're not perfect yet, Mike? Right. <laughs> well, I'm, so just to just to be clear, like I think that it's useful to examine what a what a person in this case what I believe uh, oh, yeah. by actions and um, my actions would suggest that my beliefs are are right in line with what you're describing and and I would I would say so as well but I also think that it's useful to to kind of push and pull on some ideas a little bit to, to right, see what they're <laughs> I'm ready. I'm ready to add to it. No, I, I don't know. See, don't do that, Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, uh, seriously though, like I, I don't want to, I don't want to make it sound like, um, I don't know. I'm not trying to, I don't know, be a jerk about any of this, but I do think it's useful to, to poke on some ideas a little bit. So I'm, I'm just thinking about like specifically from the, technical coaching standpoint you know if i'm one further caveat i guess so if i'm wrong about the way that i'm currently doing things and you know if i would say since you and i are in agreement if we are wrong then sure we'd want to change that as soon as possible so that's why i think stuff like this is useful so um is it that we think that kind of any technique that's reasonable. I, I mean, I, I, there's a vague term for you, right? Yeah, good. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> any any technique that's reasonable, you know, if you train it and and kind of stay in there for a while, that you adapt to it, and you know, so let's say uh, deadlifting with a rounded back, you know that if you deadlift with a rounded back consistently that your tissues adapt to it and that it at least to our current understanding probably presents you know no greater injury risk than uh than having done it otherwise or are we saying that we just don't know or something else yeah so i'm saying the the former it, that the biological changes that occur from training is are the, and the biological stresses therefore imparted on let's just focus on the back during deadlifting are gonna occur if you round your back if you're in normal lordosis and if you're in hyperextension right like so not no one set of those biological factors are particularly injurious as far as them causing a pain experience you're not going to have a pain experience outside of excessive fatigue or psychosocial factors that are pre precipitating your pain experience. So is it possible that deadlifting with a rounded back or an overextended back compared to a perfectly flat, isometrically braced <laughs> spine presents a higher level of stress? That may be true but I don't have a plausible mechanism for not only like how that would occur, but even how to like assess that, like the intervertebral, you know, intramuscular uh, pressure in the paraspinals. Like I, I, I think at that point you're trying to quantify stuff that, that probably we can't do a good enough job of, and then it's not predictive anyway. Like otherwise, again, we'd have overwhelming evidence to the contrary and we, we just don't um so i think that you said it nicely that any, any form that we would deem acceptable and I, and I think in that you 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 would have to say it's repeatable it's within whatever constraints or constraints that you are deeming for an exercise so for a deadlift the bar starts on the floor there's not a whole lot of movement of the lifter prior to the weight leaving the floor, right? If their hips are a little low at first and they rise a little bit, okay. If they're a little high and then they drop, like, okay, but they don't hitch or what? I mean, even the yeah. hitching would not terribly injurious. Uh, you know, not only is their technique going to self-resolve over time because they're going to keep getting this feedback that's like, hey, this is inefficient. If I do it this other way, oh, that felt better. Ooh, I'm going to keep doing that. And they're going to end up kind of 
it, they're going to start at this very like divergent place, like two or two lifters are, and then they're going to end up like pretty close, you know, as far as like technique determinants go. Yeah. And I think that if you, you end up doing that and you're controlling your fatigue along the way that your risk of injury is being mitigated most, most, mostly by the auto regulation of your program, meaning that you didn't ramp up volume and intensity too high. You didn't ramp, you know, the, the training stress has not been jacked up too high, you know, compared to the, whatever resources you have to train and recover and stuff like that. That's the biggest, that's the biggest deal. You're already doing 50% of the work by actually training and getting stronger, getting better. But as long as your programming allows for like, Hey, I'm actually overcooked today. Like I don't, I just don't have it. But then the program says you must put another two and a half kilos on the bar. You, I, I don't want to. Right. Like, yeah. If your program doesn't bake that in, where it's like, hey, yeah, you're just you're, the relative effort is what we're looking for. Yeah. Then that's, I think, how the injury experience, the pain experience, sort of, uh, sort of uh, starts. You uh, too much acute stress, not enough resources to deal with it, and then that layered on top of a bad mental model for this. I mean, that's just, that's the, that's the nidus for, for this pain experience. Mm. Um, you know, and then trying to talk somebody out of that, like saying, <laughs> well, so this, it's just, it's an education thing, but the person has to be open to receiving it. Right. And it's like, yeah, I know that you, your pain experience is real, you know, and, and I'm not saying that it's not, and I'm not saying that this is all in your head. I'm just saying that there are other factors besides just the biology thing that's going on. And in this particular instance, non-specific low back pain, it's, uh, this is probably not a large biological cause outside of fatigue, but that's also psychological, right? So, um, well, and then the fact that, you know, what you mentioned before, that this can reach back to things that you believe about sure. back pain that can be rooted way far back, right? That yeah. if, if you read McGill's, McGill's back mechanic, mm -hmm. so he likens the human spine to a machine. Mm -hmm. automatic now you have you're like oh well if i damage this if you damage a machine bad things happen if you damage but you're all, you're setting yourself up for failure here right you're setting yourself up for failure and he doesn't yeah. believe that there's a non-specific low back pain due to biopsychosocial factors he believes it's biomedical this has been thoroughly refuted so people are like oh come on i can't believe you're not a mcgill fan i'm like i i think this is a bad that's a bad thing to put out to people you know like you're you're setting people up for failure with that mental model, give them the real, you know, as far as we understand it to be today, this real mental model. Um, anyway. All right. Well, and with regard to McGill's stuff, having, having read a bit of, of his work, um, it wouldn't bring the whole house down, you know, like I'm, no. th from a, from like a business standpoint, it, <laughs> I don't see why it wouldn't, it wouldn't do any harm. I don't think, uh, to the message that he's sending, you know, like, Hey, if you have back pain, there's hope. And here's some general prescriptive things that you can do that will help, yep. you know, that, uh, it doesn't rely on a mechanical model. Like it, there's nothing that I can see that would prevent him from incorporating the biopsychosocial model. Yeah. It, it, he would have to end up rejecting or, or not, or, or downplaying a lot of these mechanical things that he's like said over the years, but that's all of us. Like as our understanding has grown, you know, like I used to believe and say that if your knees slide forward at the bottom of the squat, right. And your, your trunk becomes more upright. Well, you're putting more stress on the knees and that can lead to knee pain sometimes. Well, I said it. So that's, you know, that's my bad. So I've had to go back and say other things. I, I think I think the other big deal, and, and I'm, I, this is not McGill in, in in particular, but when somebody has pain from a lift, no matter what mental model they have, you know, even if they're all up on the barbell medicine, pain science stuff, and it's not our stuff. This is like the pain science stuff. It's not yeah. our stuff. Um, even if they're all up on that, they're like, well, let's say they hurt their back, like a pain after squatting. They're like, well, squats did it. I'm scared. And even if they can't admit that it's there somewhere there. And so one of the, our big things is desensitizing people to that as fast as possible. So that's why we want people to start doing body weight squats 
for instance, as soon as possible. And if they can put a bar on their back and squat to any any depth, do that. Get like, it's not just the movement. Yeah, movement is super helpful, but actually the movement in particular that you are either consciously or subconsciously worried about to break this psychological sort of barrier or like, because uh, if you are hyper vigilant to, does my back hurt while I'm doing this and you're scared, then you're going to have a pain experience potentially. It's your, your risk goes up. So we want you to like get, jump back on the horse that bucked you, you know, and, and, and it, you know, we are going to decrease the load if we have to, or change the range of motion. We'll change the bar placement. We'll change the kit that you're using, like something to let you do the movement. And, you know, there's sometimes there's no, there's no option either due to equipment stuff or just people are so, you know, uh, frazzled they can't, but we want to do something. So yeah. that's, that's actually, we got a belt squat in my, in my gym. I bought one and we've been using the crap out of that just for people who are like, I can't squat without back pain. I'm like, well, sure you can. And they body weight squat. It's fine. I didn't belt, belt squat. It's fine. And then they end up front squatting. Like it's fine. And then you just, you're kind of like desensitizing them. It's like somebody who's afraid of heights. You're like, at first you go like a hill and then it's like a bigger hill. It's funny. It's like cognitive behavior therapy for lifting weights, right? But that's why the psychological component, I mean, think about all the psychological components you've talked about over the years and people's response to training, right? Yeah. Doesn't it make sense that the, the there's a huge psychological component to the pain experience? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. And so, and so Mike, if you had, let's say that you deadlifted a bunch and you actually had all this, these micro tears and trauma, whatever to your low back, but you had no pain. Is it an injury? No. I and let's no. say that you were sedentary AF, right? But then you had chronic low back pain. Is that an injury? In the vernacular, yeah. I, yeah, the experience. I think, it, think it is, right? Correct, yeah. correct, correct. So so the point is that <clears throat> the, the association between tissue damage and pain, you know, one does not equal the other. Yeah. You can have pain with no tissue damage. You can have tissue damage with no pain. And I wouldn't focus on the biological component for, for a lot of the lifting related pain things, unless it's like a Q fracture or like somebody hit you with a barbell. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What about uh, simpler things? Like um, let's say a, a strained pec, you're benching, you feel pop, you know, it's not like detached or anything. It's not going to require surgery, but you take, it, you know, it's, it's sore. You take some time, you're going to need to take some time away from benching because of the pain associated with that. Yeah. But well, so where does I, that fit for you? Yeah. So the first part is it, the subjective, uh, sort of report of a pop, a pull, a t like some sort of audible, anything is very unreliable. Okay. And, and a lot of times, especially there's a huge recall bias where people are like, Oh yeah, I heard a pop. Or they'll, and it's not that they're manufacturing this, like confabulating or something like that. It's like they perceive that to be real, but the presence or absence of that is meaningless. Doesn't that does not improve the diagnostic sort of sensitivity of any sort of you just don't. It's not that you want to ignore it. You're validating it. You're like, okay, I understand. Sure. That's your truth. You're living it. Cool. But it doesn't. It doesn't make it any better or worse. So somebody says, "Oh, I hurt my pec. I heard a pop," and then you're immediately you're looking for like. Bit large biological causes that would shift the scale, right? So if you have somebody like, yeah, I, I actually am lacking a ton of internal rotation and like, you know, <laughs> I can't move my arm and there's huge bruise and there's a knot like obviously detached. You're like, okay, that is a, there's a larger biological input to your pain experience there. But somebody lacking all those things, they just have ah, my shoulder hurt, my pec, pec at the pec tie in when I'm benching. I'm like, okay, well, can you bench the bar with any grip? at any at any range of motion one block two block three block four block five block pin you know whatever and they're like oh yeah i can do this i'm like cool that's where we're starting and if they say no i'm like well what about overhead press and they're like and then again same sort of deal from the shoulders from you know chin level from okay you can't do any of that all right well what about like isometric work can you do any of that you're effectively trying to find out where what's the furthest you can t take them where they don't have pain because you're trying to desensitize them. Most of the time, the experience of having like, even if it's acute, but there, and if there's, there's, there's no evidence of like 
overt trauma that there's a deformity and like sudden loss of function. But e even if you perceive this to be acute, it's actually probably an insidious cause from fatigue buildup that's yeah. too much too soon. So I think one of the very first things I heard you ever say or like responses that I was like, nah, I like this guy. I'm going to give him my money. <laughs> <laughs> if somebody was like, Mike, you have people bench like four days a week, five days, you know, isn't that bad for your shoulders? And you're like, why would it be bad for your shoulders? You know, it, you, you work your way, self, self up to that. Like it can be fine as long as you manage fatigue appropriately. So yeah, it's the same thing. You're, you're trying to get them desensitized to something they perceive as a threat and you're going to take them as far as they can go. And then you're get, that's your progressive overload, maybe range of motion, maybe load both likely in this case. Um, yeah, I, I like that approach in general. You know, like I think it in that case, it, it works in a variety of uh, uh, situations. You know, like if you do have something that is more, you know, acute tissue damage, then, OK, we're just going to limit the load, limit the range of motion to something that you can handle. Um, but then uh, whether this is... Uh, I don't know the the idea of of flushing uh, blood through an injured area. Uh, that's like popular powerlifting parlance oh, yeah. as far as uh, uh, you know something that's supposed to be good for injuries. And whether it is or not, it probably creates a positive psychological uh, disposition. Yes. You know, so you know, hey, hey, there's plenty of reasons to do it. You know, regardless of what the cause is. So I like I like that as a general uh approach um because it, it works on a variety of conditions yeah and, and even think about like i mean because you've done coaching seminars where you review people's lifts like in person and and i'm sure if your experience has been anything like ours somebody be like yeah i've been i haven't been able to low bar squat for instance for a while because my elbows or my shoulders or something and you're like oh well let me see it and then you like make a few changes and they're like oh that's actually tolerable and you're like aha technique you see but usually the 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 change that's changes that are happening at the same time is reduced load because it's a foreign technique to them or foreign sort of organization of different body parts in a complex movement. So they usually have to take the load down, uh, and and they've usually also given I, I, or either decreased fatigue in the short term to sort of allow them to even participate in you know, this technique change, meaning that I've switched my exercise to a less fatiguing variation for that particular injury or, or pain experience. So if I was doing low bar, sure, that places maybe a higher demand on the shoulder girdle. But if you do a high bar, maybe there's less demand there. And so you've kind of dissipated some fatigue. And then now Mike is the savant who changed my <laughs> low yeah, bar and technique. And it's like, well, dude, this is way lighter. You've been doing high bar for two weeks. Your shoulders don't hurt anymore. I didn't do this. this is just like the natural course of that particular pain experience. Same well, thing with. Oh, well, I was just going to say, like, it's like you said as well, you know, you've got an authority figure telling you, Hey, exactly. do this. This is better. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's the same thing with the back injury too. Though. All right. So like people are, I should, just, instead of saying back injury, I'll say the back pain experience. Uh, it's people will have it and then they'll do all this stuff in the interim for two or three weeks and be like, yeah, and that made my back feel better. And it's like, well, your back was going to feel better in a few weeks anyway. That's the natural course of this deal. I mean, a large proportion of herniated discs even will reabsorb in, you know, the months following that, that insult. That being said, when people say, look, I got an MRI. I had, I, I was deadlifting the other day and I herniated a disc. See, my MRI showed it. I have a herniated disc. And it's like, well, unless you have an MRI directly before that suggesting that you didn't have a herniated disc and now you do, I don't, I have no reason to believe that the deadlift caused you to herniate a disc. Where do you see? So imagine for a minute that, that you're not you uh, oh, and you man. don't have the credentials that, that you've got, uh, that you're a, uh, rather ordinary uh, online powerlifting coach. Oh, well, that is you're describing me very well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I think you have a. Uh, well, I, I guess what I'm asking is more of like, where do you see scope of practice fitting into this? Oh, sure. Yeah, you know, like on one hand, um, I think there's solid justification for the, all the things that you're talking about. On the other hand, 
um, if I'm, you know, regular, regular old powerlifting coach, I've been lifting for a number of years and decided I'm going to start doing this for money. And one of my lifters comes back from the doctor with an MRI and their doctor has told them they've got degenerative disc disease. And, you know, how do you broach that topic with your, with your client without, without coming out and saying, Hey, your doctor's full of crap, which is probably not helpful. Yeah, I agree. So I think, you know, you got to be risk, you're trying to be risk averse, but there's multiple risks here. So there's a risk, there's a non-zero risk to resistance training for bad outcomes, like, and in this particular context, pain, pain experience. So that being said, the injury risk from resistance training is very, very low compared to other sports, but there is a non-zero risk uh, to for pain uh, when or an injury when engaging resistance training, there's also a large risk to being sedentary. So you, you're you're trying to balance those things. Now, if I uh, if I was not a doctor but I was a coach and somebody came in and they had presumably they had back pain and that's why they went to their doctor and presumably they had back pain for many many weeks, uh, assuming that their clinicians are actually following the recommended guidelines for low back imaging. So they either had signs and symptoms for an extended period of time that failed to resolve or worsening signs and symptoms of low back pain that triggered their doctor to order this advanced imaging diagnostic, like an MRI, or signs and symptoms that were worrisome for something that they wanted to diagnose. Uh, they'd, specifically, you're looking for clearance to train. Specifically, you're, you're saying, hey, your doctor, okay, you exercise. And that it's incumbent upon the client or the trainee at that point to, to get that information. And so if the doctor says no, specifically, you want to know why, right? So because, again, it's a risk benefit. So why can't I resistance train? And if the doctor saying because you're at increased risk of, you know, a triple uh, this abdominal aortic aneurysm dissection that we found as a <laughs> incidental finding on imaging and we need to repair that in the next week, then you're like, oh, well, that's real. <laughs> yeah. But if they're saying because you have degenerative disc disease, that's not enough. Because, in, in, for instance, in that particular instance, the risks of not training, the risks of being sedentary or uh, 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 in, in not being active and engaging in uh, regular uh, resistance training is far outweighs the potential uh, uh, risk of being injured. But And the doctor, it's incumbent upon them to know that. I'm not saying that always happens. Yeah. But as a strength coach, if I had no medical knowledge outside of what I'd heard on the internet, I would just, you're trying to ask, you know, well, what are the risks or what are the benefits? And ultimately the client is going to make that decision. Yeah. And if then the client said, hey, you know, I went through this discussion with my doctor and he said it's up to me. And, you know, he thinks that I might be at some increased risk of having further back pain because of this issue. I'm not really too worried about it, but I'd like your guidance. Then you're in the clear. And you need to, the, the steps to training them are really no different than what you do with somebody else. You're still risk averse. You're still trying to gradually work up the training stress. Uh, and I think the psychological aspects of coaching become even more important. Yeah. Totally I, would, I would highly avoid being like, man, you have to do it perfectly. Otherwise, you're going to hurt your back. That's the worst thing you could do at that point. Second worst thing, because the first worst thing would be like, okay, today we're doing five by five on deficit deadlifts <laughs> and uh, <laughs> at RP9 for every set. Like right. that would be the worst thing you could do. But the second worst thing you could do is is foster this culture of perfectionism and hypervigilance towards pain. So asking them, at, for instance, after every set, do you have pain? How is your pain? You're, being high, you're, you're fostering this culture of being hypervigilance. Doesn't mean you don't care, but rather you can check in at the end of a session. Hey, how was it? Yeah. Hey, and uh, we actually use that. So in our templates, we do, uh, we track session RPE as well. Uh, so I've alluded to this like sort of acute workload versus chronic workload, what you've been adapted mm -hmm. to. And there's actually some data on this called, uh, that's basically the acute to chronic uh, workload ratio. And so the values are, it's funny, arbitrary units and chronic arbitrary units. And the way that you, calculate that is by the time spent training, duration of training, and session RPE. So 
if you've had a bunch of session RPs at RP10, RP10, at the end of the session, you're like, I could do no more. That's the, that just wiped me. Even if it really wasn't that much volume or that much intensity, but whatever psychological state you were in prior to training, whatever environmental state you were, like all of that conspired to make it RP10. That can have an effect on how, how much stress is being delivered to the person. So imagine, imagine you after your first back tweak, right? You went to, and, and at that point you're deadlifting 800 pounds or something like that because you're a savage. Like that was your previous best deadlift. But then you come back to the gym and the, the mere act of trying to pull 405 for a set of five gets you so hyper aroused and so vigilant or whatever that at the end you rate that session RP10. Well, we have to do something to mitigate that acute stress because presumably presumably, there's been some period of time where you've actually detrained and your workload tolerance has actually gone down. So we might have to prescriptively say, all right, we got to lower the RPE down. We need to shorten the session duration, decrease the volume, something to try to get that acute stress to the right point. But for the strength coach, you're looking for clearance, Clarence, you're looking for clearance from the doctor on any condition that you don't feel comfortable managing without <laughs> that specific thing. And so for me, uh, it's really, it's really any reason that the person went to the doctor, uh, besides your standard run of the mill checkup. So effectively, if someone goes and sees a specialist for care of a particular issue, then I'm asking just for doctor's clearance. So, oh, I had a lipoma removed. I'm like, cool. Can you train? Can you exercise? Because perhaps the stitches or whatever at risk for dehiscence up to a certain point. And so maybe they can't. Yeah. Or maybe they can only do lower body stuff if it was on their back, for instance. So sure. Yeah. Just that that's my general rule of thumb for people who aren't medical professionals. Uh, because you don't want to take that risk on yourself unless you right. have like, extra training. Right. Yeah. And I mean that's that's useful. So we're uh maybe we're not able to that's good. Be very I got specific on I was gonna say, maybe if we can't be specific on reps and then we can be specific on other things that are arguably more important. So sure. Yeah, it, yeah. It, it, it it's just again, I have seen where people say, Yeah, my doctor said I can't exercise. Yeah. Like, Do they really say that? Because again, the risk of being sedentary is huge uh for like a lot of things. And so I'd wanna know if that's true and if so, why? And what's the clinic, you know, you know, what's the clinical rationale? And then you got to weigh those risks and benefits. And I think that's a conversation that has to be had for each individual, for each particular case. And I'll fully admit that most doctors are going to pull a sort of recommendation out of thin air, the standard ah, four to six weeks, just take four to six weeks off after a, you know, hernia repair, for instance, or some sort of small, you know, surgical procedure, four to six weeks. That's made up. It's made up, but that doesn't make it wrong. It's just the doctor is being risk averse too. They think, yeah, by four to six weeks, I expect all primary and secondary healing processes to be mostly complete, and I have no sort of restrictions on this person. Yeah. But but the person might feel good after two or three weeks, for instance, and be like, yeah, I'm ready to get back to it or whatever. And then that's a conversation they have to have with their doctor. Like, hey, man, I feel good. Like, I'm going to go squat today. And the doctor said, don't do it. It's like, well, the, the person's taking that into their own hands. You're not making that decision as a strength coach. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, I hope. I hope. <laughs> Otherwise, <laughs> come on, man. We've got the Arnold coming up. We got <laughs> got a peak on time, man. No, that's that's, right. that's that's good, man. So it gives people, I, it, it gives coaches a, a good, I think, base to operate from. Would you ever, um, I guess, delicately, probably? Uh, advise someone to seek a second opinion. Well, hold on before, before we, I go there, I just want to say that m I think it's interesting how experiences with any sort of professional, but in this case, we're talking about medical professionals, how experiences differ. So, so widely, oh, um, yeah. but you, let me take it away from medical or stop beating up on doctors for just a second. Mm -hmm. Um, I've had a number of, of people, friends, clients get kicked out of gyms before commercial gyms for deadlifting and things like that, you know, and I've deadlifted in all manner of commercial gyms. And, and I mean, maybe it's, maybe it's hard to imagine now, uh, but 
back before CrossFit became a thing, most people didn't deadlift in gyms and gyms were not equipped for that. And, um, you know, it was weird and people thought you were dropping the weights and all this stuff. And, um, I've never had that issue. Uh, and that's after having deadlifted a lot of weight all over. And part of it, I think is the level that I'm at that I think if you show up to a gym and you're lifting a massive amount of weight, then people assume some degree of competence. But I also think that there's a significant degree of, of interpersonal skill that comes into play here. And (laughs) (laughs) I would say that that's true of, of people's experience in, in the uh, medical community as well. You know, like, I mean, I've had, negative experiences with doctors before, but I think a lot of it can be overcome if the, the client, the patient is educated in some way, can ask better questions, uh, can, you know, uh, has the social awareness to, to know how to interact with somebody who's really just another human. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Ask the right questions. Like, yeah. Hey, yeah, I mean, so, so something that I regularly counsel people on is look, if you get diagnosed to something, all right. And, and, and literally anything, uh, but especially if you're being prescribed either a medication or specific intervention for that thing, it is incumbent upon you to understand why you're being prescribed that intervention or medication, the determinants of your diagnosis, like how is this so you understand something about your own sort of medical disease history. That way you can like tell another doctor about that in the future if need be. And so that you understand for your own edification. And then as it relates to training, you have to ask, well, what restrictions do you have, if any? And if you're not, if you don't know what you were diagnosed with, what medication you were prescribed and why, and then if you can exercise, well, how can a strength coach who wasn't there comment on that sure i I mean you can't even a doctor couldn't even do that i I could try to piece together the puzzle right if somebody if somebody came in to me said hey i was started on lisinopril 10 i go okay why because there are a handful of things but most common thing would be high blood pressure but there's a you know there's some other things that people could be prescribed that medication for and uh and they would be like, uh, it wasn't my blood pressure. Uh, my blood pressure was kind of, was kind of high. I'm like, okay, so maybe you have high blood pressure. Maybe you also have, you know, diabetes or prediabetes. And maybe you have this other, th- you know, it could be any number of things. And then I say, all right, well, you know, when are you going back in to, to see the doctor again? I, say, I, I don't know. Like, oh, okay. So you're telling me you have no follow-up. That seems unlikely. And then it's like, well, did the doctor, <laughs> <laughs> and then did the doctor say anything about if you could exercise, you know, uh, without any restrictions? Oh, all right. I didn't even ask. It's like, wait, let me get this straight. You were diagnosed with something for the first time, started on a medication that you never previously never taken before, right? You don't, and you don't necessarily know why, and you don't know if you can exercise. Like, I don't know if I feel comfortable saying, ah, you're probably fine. Like, right. you know, I don't, I don't think I can say yeah. that. And I think, and that's me with medical training. So yeah. strength coach, I think you just have to say, hey, the doctor give you the okay to train. Right. And then you ask the second question, if not, why? And if there are restrictions, why? Yeah, but I agree with you. I've never been kicked out of a gym either, just as an aside. Yeah, I mean, and, I, for what it's worth, it's a heck of a lot less common now. And I, for every time that I've ever had a client have that happen, and not to say that everybody who's ever been kicked out of a gym for deadlifting or whatever has been in the wrong, but anytime I've ever had that happen, at least that I can recall, uh, I've kind of thought about the client and I thought, eh, I could see where that would happen. <laughs> 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 yeah. I mean, well, first, no one's kicking you out. I mean, dude, you're 275 pound behemoth. Uh, so that that's definitely a factor. You know, sure, I, I, I understand. I understand that that's a factor, but I also think, you know, when somebody comes over and asks, Hey, uh, what are you doing there? You know, you, <laughs> you, doing you there, Mike? right. You don't just growl at them or something, you know, like, yeah. Oh, that's not the appropriate response. <laughs> right. That's well, what I do. Especially if, if, you know, you're, you're deadlifting something that's 
not intimidating to the normal person and then you act like a jerk, then yeah, I mean, you're probably probably on your way to find a new place to train. You imagine Mike walks into your gym again, big behemoth of a guy, he takes all the plates, which were all previously left on the leg press, but assume that's that's <laughs> the, those are the plates that you're taking. You brought your computer in, your right. Tendo unit. <laughs> <laughs> Other things that make tripod. you not threatening. <laughs> yeah, tripod. And, uh, it's like, he's doing an experiment. Let's just let that guy do his thing. Nobody's picking you up. Yeah, man. I had, I had one time uh, that it was close to close to getting kicked out the one time uh in my in my lifting career i had just moved to uh, minot north dakota and i was training at the ymca there and Mm -hmm. they actually had a a deadlift platform this was so this would have been 2007 2008 They they have a deadlift platform you know so i'm up there deadlifting and i work into the 700 pound range now the sure the weight room at the Minot YMCA is on the second floor and why people put weight rooms on the second floor. Oh no. Kind of beyond me. But when I would put the weights down, there's like a ripple that goes through the the whole floor. Yeah. (laughs) And I didn't, I didn't understand this or experience this until later when I was around other people who were deadlifting. And I was like, Oh crap, I can see why that's a little disconcerting now. You yes. know, but I'm putting the weight down like you would in a, like a competition deadlift. Like I'm not air dropping the thing, you know. Is that not oh uh, apparently that's not good. Time I've been, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh I remember the, the guy came over and, and was uh talking to me about like you gotta stop dropping the bar. And I'm like, I'm not dropping the bar. <laughs> He's like you got to stop dropping the bar. And I'm like, do you want to, it got to the point where I was like, do you want to come over here and show me how to put this down more carefully? Because I don't know what you're talking about. And about that time, another guy who was a a powerlifter came over and kind of intervened on my behalf. Later on, we become friends. And, um, but yeah, that was, (laughs) I'm, I'm lucky that he did probably because that was probably the one time where, uh, my interpersonal skills were failing me. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the video? Was it was it Benny deadlifting? It was a thousand eight or a thousand thirty one or whatever it was. It, it was all chrome plates. He has like an MHP shirt on or whatever, and it's a, it's a thousand plus. And he rips this thing off the floor, easy pull. By the way, that's probably the most impressive deadlift I've ever seen. In any event. He sets it down, I swear to you, like softer than your average gym goer's 405. He likes it and it's like, dink. And I'm like, you know what? I just, if you are setting your deadlifts down in a way that's disturbing to other people, like within reason, then I think, you know, just watch this video. If Benny, (laughs) and and I've been around you when you're pulling, you're not like a, you're not a bar, uh, uh, you're not slamming bars. Like that's not your... I know well, everybody on the internet thought that that was you. <laughs> <laughs> well, for what it's worth, uh, back in the day, I remember having a conversation with uh, with Brian Siders, who oh yeah, I know man, Brian. his training habits are just fascinating. Just, com- I, I want to get in touch with him at some point and and have him on the podcast as well, just because he's just fascinating dude to talk to. Was a super, yeah, man, he was he was the man for a long time. Yeah. Um, bro was the first in the IPF to total 2,500 and 2,600 and maybe yeah. 2,700 too. Like he really broke a lot of new ground. When I um, moved to Norfolk, he was there. Oh yeah. Like, Oh God. And then he left. <laughs> so I felt better about myself. And but then David Ricks moved to Norfolk uh, and I was like, God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, Brian, I remember talking to him. So uh, he trained, in his garage or yeah, in a, I think it was a garage, you know? Yeah. And, uh, I remember talking to him at one point and, and, uh, he was telling me that he would train at night. So his training sessions were like legendary, uh, the, the, for a while there, there was a website that had a, a training log of his on and it had like four weeks of training or whatever. But the dude did like four hour long training sessions, six days a week, you know, just, yeah standard rts program <laughs> right, right no just i mean 
huge, huge training volumes. Um, anyway, so talking to him, he was, uh, he works during the day. Uh, he worked as a, a psychologist at a prison. And uh, then at night, uh, well, in the afternoon, evening, he was spending time with his daughter. After he put his daughter to bed at night, he would get ready and go train. So he's not starting his training sessions till like 10 p.m. And then they're four hours long, you know. Um, so he'd be deadlifting. It's in the middle of the night, you know, and you're trying not to. He was saying that he, in order to not bother his neighbors at that time of night, he had to set his deadlifts down really carefully. Oh. And, uh, you know, like nice, slow, controlled, no, no extra noise, like what you're talking about with what Benny did. You know, yeah. and I remember t- talking to him. I was like, man, that sucks. He's like, well, actually, I feel like it's really helped my deadlift. I feel like my deadlift is better now that I've had to train under eccentric. a bit more control. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's getting an eccentric uh, training benefit. There you go. In like, before the internet picks up on these like eccentric, these 530 tempo <laughs> <laughs> deadlifts or something. Man, if it's good enough for Brian Siders, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, it's. Anyway, so I, one more thing I want to talk to you about uh, with oh, sure. regard to uh, technique, if we've got the time. Oh, sure. Um, uh, this has been several weeks ago now. Uh, I asked a, a question uh, on my Instagram. Now, again, like I'm starting from the, uh, the common ground that like we're in agreement on things, so things with regard to technique, technical coaching and, and its roles and things like that. And, um, so I ask on, on my Instagram, if, if you start, like, if you're not going to refute this idea that, uh, you know, movement causes injury, you know, if you're not refuting that, then is there still a reason to, uh, to teach coach, like this movement perfection type of uh, technical coaching outside of performance. You know, if you just feel like it's better for performance to squat this way or that way, then that would be one thing, obviously one reason to, to coach it. But, you know, outside of that, why, you know, and I got back a few good answers. And one that I wanted to, to just see what you thought is this idea that, uh, if you had a better technical approach that it's going to distribute these training stresses across tissues more evenly and across tissues that are more capable of adaptation, uh, that adapt faster, you know, so, you know, your cartilage is not going to adapt very fast if at all. And then, but you know, muscles, muscle fibers will you know, that type of yeah. thinking, right? Yeah, so absolutely. what do you think of this, this idea? Yeah, I mean, so I think, I think that the idea makes sense from like this sort of, uh, you feel good about distributing things evenly, it sounds nice. But like, just like being imbalanced, like, oh, you want your, all of your muscular tissues balanced you say that and you're like it sounds nice but you know me, not true you don't want your the the characteristics of each muscle balanced that's not how the human bipedal organism operates right your quadriceps are stronger than your hamstrings for instance and that's due to the pination angle and muscle fiber cross-sectional area per cubic inch or whatever volumetric unit you want to use but in any event I, i'm not concerned with distributing training stress quote unquote evenly i and further i think that applying stress to the human or the biological organism, the human in this case, the most deficient tissues are going to receive the largest training stress anyway. Like you can't avoid that, right? If something's relatively untrained or undertrained, it's going to get a bigger impetus to adapt. And in so far as you can control that via technique, I don't know if that's actually possible. I, I, I think the real argument for coaching technique outside of performance is there are two 
well, there are three thing, three components here. So thing one is this repeatability, right? So if you want to train somebody and set them up for long-term success in their resistance training career, you'd want them to be able to do a squat in a fairly similar mat, uh, fashion, you know, throughout their training career so that, you, again, you could add stress, add fatigue, add you know, progressively overload their training in whatever fashion they, that is uh, uh, in line with their goals, right? And if, they, if their technique was all over the place, you, you couldn't do that. It, you know, it has to be on like a fairly tight band in order to allow for you to add reps or add more sets, or whatever. Otherwise, you're going to get, you know, the sort of art, of, you know, failure by artifact of terrible technique, right? So, and, and on what that's kind of performance, but it's on the other hand, it's like allows them to actually be trainable by having sort of this repeatable, consistent technique. Uh, the other thing that you would want to do is use a technique that actually is, I guess, more consistent for a particular person. So I use the example of Bryce Lewis and uh, his high bar squat all the time. So people are like, but well, Bryce Lewis high bars, don't you think he'd squat more low bar? I'm like, no, because I think that if one, he's definitely tried it, you know, and then as he prefers the high bar squat likely for reasons he doesn't even, you know, hasn't consciously like, you know, thought about, but either the low bar training with the volumes and, 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 and intensities and et cetera, he needs to make his squat be competitive. He can't tolerate that low bar. So he picks high bar. He feels more comfortable doing it. His technique and anthropometry, et cetera, is more maybe uh, set up to do high bar and that's what he prefers. So you'd, you'd want something that is quote unquote more trainable from a, from this, that same sort of consistency standpoint and, and uh, uh, doesn't necessarily um, increase training fatigue too much just by using a different technique. So for me, for instance, front squats, I am not a good front squatter. My best back squat is 640. My best front squat, I've missed 405 like 20 times. I've done 396, then I go to 405 or 407, whatever it's in kilos, and I can't, I can't do it. It's just the front rack position. And so, but if you program just a block of front squats, sure, my front squat would improve, but I'd have way more fatigue doing that particular variation for a bunch of different reasons, biological, psychological, social reasons. And so it's just, uh, I probably wouldn't want to use that particular technique uh, to train my squat. It's just not very trainable. The third component would be actually not fostering this sort of perfectionist attitude. I would want to do the opposite because I think when you say that there's good technique and these are your ideals for injury prevention, that you're, you're setting, you're setting yourself up for a bad experience in the future because then somebody would be vigilant towards technique breakdown. So I, I again, I think the, to the best the way that I can describe it now is the reason I think you should coach people how to lift is to improve their efficiency and 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 sort of repeatability within training and selecting training variations that allow them to actually complete and comply and see results from their training but really focusing on minutia outside of performance sort of improvements i think is actually a, a misstep and so it's funny when we used to coach seminars like two years ago i i would love to have had cameras on and just the the different cues and the amount of cues and the frequency of, was much, way higher than it is now. Now we're like, mm, yeah, it's probably okay. You know, it's it's if if people want to geek out on performance, then we can kind of add another layer of nuance there. But um, as far as like, is this safe? Yeah. Now, if somebody's a train wreck, and if we, you know, to the best that we can define that, you know, they're squatting down and their back is actively undergoing like massive flexion, the bars way in front of their toes, you know, like what all sorts of badness um, that, you know, people would really cry foul about on the internet. The biggest problem there is an injury risk, in my view. Rather, the biggest risk is how do they act, how can they train that thing? Because it changes every rep, it's all over the map. So we need to improve techniques so that they can train a little bit more consistently and actually apply stress to the desired tissues. So I guess in one way, that's kind of like what you were saying at the beginning, although I just don't think that you can, I think you're missing training effects by having wildly varying technique. You know, that's like if, if half of your squats were three inches above parallel, you're getting a slightly different training stress than if all of your squats are one inch below parallel. 
Um, and it's not that one is better than the other. They're just different sort of training adaptations you're selecting for. And I don't think that has anything to do with injury. I think it has more to do with performance outcomes. Yeah. yeah so I, yeah. I don't know, where do you end up getting back to? Well, I'm, I'm tracking with you there too. And this fits, this fits to my understanding nicely with the uh, kind of constraints led technical models. Um, the, uh, I've called it uh, self-organized technique. Oh, uh, sure. Yep. Things like that, you know, like letting people kind of figure out for themselves a little bit, um, you know, things like small details, things like foot placement, yeah. um, hand Girl. placement, you know, and, and even some things that are not such small details like uh, leg drive in a bench press or, you know, things like that. And I think you can give them tasks that help them to feel what it is to do it one way or another. And they, it's kind of a, a situation where, Oh, I, I like how that felt. I performed better when I did it that way. So I'm going to keep doing it that way. So it's a, it's a reward system that's kind of built into it, you know, sure. and you're improving their self-efficacy too, because yeah. you're letting them, I mean, which is a huge part of training compliance in general, Right. If you if if you're fostering this culture where they need you to handhold them and tell them to do all of these things that and, you know, that might be good for a business model, but bad for the training outcomes because you're not giving them the sort of self-efficacy sort of stimulus and also this sort of like resiliency thing. Like someone sends me a video and, you know, their back's rounding a little bit in a deadlift. I don't freak out and type back in all caps. Oh, my God go get the disc. It's, you know, <laughs> it has exploded from your spine. I, I'm saying, well, you know, I think we could do a little bit better job training your erectors, for instance, at holding this isometric position to the extent that that's actually important. And, uh, you know, try better, try, try that, try it this way next time. Well, and, and like, if I think too about, uh, I had a conversation with, uh, uh, Dr. Megan Bryanton. Uh, oh yeah. A she while did. ago. She did that study of like uh, with knuckle, well, not with knuckles, but knuckles has been a big supporter of her work. She was big on like net joint moments uh, in this different quad variations. I, I think so. I think yeah, right. so. Um, I've had a, a couple lifters uh, get kind of a biomechanical analysis from her. Sure. And uh, in our conversation, one of the things that one of the questions I had for her was, you know, in what way do you like, how do you coach detailed technique when we know that um, even big, even we know that uh, anthropometrics vary drastically from person to person in ways that we can't even see, you know, so it's not a, a matter of, you know, people with long femurs need to squat this way. It's, uh, things like the architecture of the hip joint matters, uh, sure. and then Muscle injury system. history matters. And then all the, the biopsychosocial things that we've been talking about this whole time, all that stuff matters. So how do you presume to coach somebody to say like, Oh, well, if you, not to say that she does this, but like, if you tweak your toe angle just a little bit this way or that way that, uh, you know, outcomes would improve. Like that's, that's a really narrow level of granularity, you yeah, know? Which um, she said that the way that she coaches technique. So she's looking at attempts in, in a competition setting. Uh, and really what she's looking for is variation between yeah. the first attempt and the third attempt, you know? And so if, if you see that, changes are happening due to load, then that tells you something interesting that it's not an intentional action by the lifter at that point, most likely uh, yeah. it's, it's something else. And I thought that was a really smart way of kind of letting the lifter tell you what's their ideal and then show you what deviations from that ideal look like. Yeah. You know, I thought that was a, a smart way to handle it. I guess the interesting thing would be like, well, what do you do with that? Like, you know, so there's, there was, uh, it was one of those wired, like, uh, YouTube videos, like why no one can throw above, you know, well, no one will ever throw 110 miles an hour. 
And so they have this guy in front of like a high speed camera and he's the host of the show. So he's like athletic, but not, he's not a pitcher. And so they're like breaking down his throw and the coach is like, oh, see, you need way more external rotation here and your arm needs to be back here like this, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, well, yeah, of course his technique is not good. He's not a pitcher, right? Like, and he's not an elite pitcher. So the model that you're trying to like jam him into is beyond his current level of training. And he may never get there due to like factors that have predated him cut walking into your lab. So it's like, okay, you see this video of technique that is not ideal according to, you know, whatever model you're like organizing your thoughts around. But then what do you do with that unless it's like a gross, you know, irregularity other than point it out? Yeah, hey, Mike, on your third attempt deadlift, your uh, thoracic spine rounded a little bit. You're like, yeah, no shit. It's my third attempt deadlift. Like, it was heavy. Well, and it, 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 so what I'm getting at is that how does this affect management, right? Like, are you going to now do a bunch more, you know, pendle rows or like, you know, pause deadlifts to, to fix that? I mean, I, I think it's not the only way to go, but I think it could be a, a I think it's good idea generation, you know, yeah. and I mean, that, that's all any of it is. And, and I don't mean, I don't say that to minimize it at all. It's all idea generation as far as I'm concerned until you've run the trial and tested, Oh, this lifter consistently responds to X, you know, it's all, it's just an idea until you get to that point. Um, sure. So I think, sure. I think it would be interesting idea generation to say, okay, your, your background's, when the load is sufficient and also with loads that you're unlikely to see on a consistent basis in training. Yeah. Uh, does that tell us something about what's potentially a limiting factor? How come, how come you can deadlift, you know, 700, but not 705, you know, something along those lines. Yeah. I, to me, to me, yeah, I agree with the idea generation thing, although it does seem to reduce to like purely biological factors in the performance, you know? So, so it's like, so again, just going back to this background, anything like we assume that this is bad because it's limiting efficiency, which may, may not be the case. It's like, Hey, yeah, Mike, on all, all of your third attempt deadlifts from the last 10 years, your back is more rounded compared to the second and first attempt, you're like, well, yeah, it's heavier. So, and it's like, well, maybe you do that because you're actually better at lifting in that organization. And you'd be even better if you practice that. Uh, or maybe again, your psychosocial attitudes to psycho psychosocial influence at it, you know, going into the lift is like, oh, this is heavy. I gotta, you know, uh, you do something that's like, you See, organize it in a way. No, no, that's that's an excellent point. And and also a point where I think the self-organization of technique can can be a potential answer to that, right? So exactly. How do you know that maybe you would just deadlift better overall if you changed whatever about the configuration, you know, or uh, if we're talking about bench, if your elbows were flared slightly more, or slightly less, something like that. Unless you get to the point where you say, well, I've, I've tried it in training because I've tried a million things in training over yeah. time. And yeah. I've found that this is consistently better. You know, however, under sufficient load, I tend to have this type of, of breakdown, you know, the breakdown in the sense that it's a change that's not intentional, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think, uh, yeah, that's having good training history is super useful from that standpoint. And then also like um, understanding the limitations of an analyzing technique for like performance improvements, provided that it's, there's not gross error. I mean, yeah. That, yeah. And so I, what I end up saying at like, we make these like lift, like how to do this lift video. And it's like, so like what grip is best for the bench press, like grip width. And it's like, well, the one that allows you to like train the bench press with the most amount of like volume at relative intensity, that's, you know, suitable to your goals. Uh, that's the best one for you. Does, you know, there's not one grip that's clearly superior than the other. And, you know, what about elbow angles? I guess, well, so that's going to be influenced by your grip width and your, 
you know, anthropometry and all these other factors, blah, blah, blah. But the one that allows you to train most consistently, reliably, and has the most trainability is going to be the best one likely for you long term. And that's, that's where I kind of end up on all these technique things. Yeah. But none of them is about risk aversion. Or yeah, like, no, like I agree. Yeah, I definitely aversion. get you there. Yeah. And, and I think that's a, it's an interesting point that you, or it's a, it's a good point that you bring up that it's only kind of these different things all fitting together in a certain network that, uh, that gives it kind of a logical consistency because if you're not allowing say self-organization of technique, then the logic of the rest of it breaks down. Oh you know? yeah. Yeah. Similarly, if you were a person who's like, there is this one model for this exercise, then you can't allow for self organization of technique, right? And like differences between people that, you know, aren't just based on anthropometry. You say, well, that one's suboptimal. It's like, yeah, but that's a world record holder. How could, by definition, it's not suboptimal. Yeah, man, that, that, <laughs> that calls to mind a conversation I, I had with, uh, with a friend of mine uh, a couple of years ago, we were talking about, um, we we're talking about Ray actually. Uh, and we were talking about his training program for the squat and oh, uh, or something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and just that he was training in a way, at least at that time, that was kind of counter to the prevailing, prevailing wisdom of the powerlifting community, you know, and, and, you know, I said, Hey, you know, we, we have this thing that we think is correct. You know, you got to train the squat with a lot of frequency and a lot of volume and, you know, yet the best squatter on the planet doesn't do any of that. You know, yeah. uh, what do you have to say about that? You know, and, and I think that's a valid criticism. <laughs> you know, I think, I think that you have to contend with that seriously. It can't be just like, I don't think you can hand wave it away and just say, Oh, well, there's exceptions to everything or, Oh, well, he's a special case or, Oh, well, or, and I also think it's super arrogant to be like, oh, how much better would he be if he only listened to me? Like, oh, yeah, right, man. Get out of here with that. <laughs> well, if all Olympic weightlifters just did the low bar back squat, uh, they'd be, you know, I mean, breaking yeah. <laughs> God, you, you just got to. Uh, people, so I, I think, I t you know, people who've been in strength sports, who've achieved a high level of success and therefore have like, like been in the sport for, for years on end have self organized into training methods that they have found to be useful for them, training techniques that have found to be useful for them. And I think ultimately we can learn lessons from, from each of them. It's just, there's no one way to do this and to suggest that there's like a, a model that we, that we're pushing everyone towards, I think is a too reductionist for me. I, I think rather, you know, we have certain physiological tenants that we can try to like figure out, well, why does this work for him? You know, whatever. But rather than say, yeah, I don't know. It, nope. He doesn't, he's, he's an outlier or she's an outlier or whatever. It's like, it's just maybe our understanding isn't as good as, it, as we, we thought it was initially. No, I, I mean, that, that notion suits me quite well. Cause I mean, I was kind of brought up in the era that, that loved to look at elite performers and assume that there's something to be learned uh, from, from those experiences. And I think the error there is that we probably drew more than we had good reason to draw sure. you know, and, and assumed that the reasons that were given were actual reasons. Sure. Um, however, it seems like, I don't know if it's, the powerlifting community in general or just kind of the part of it that I'm exposed to seems to be a little bit more the other way now and is really willing to, to write off uh, elite performances as uh, just a byproduct of elite genetics and that they're thriving in spite of whatever they're doing. If, unless whatever they're doing is, you know, perfectly in line with current research. And I don't think that that's the right way to look at it either. You know, I think that there's, uh, you can kind of take from both, you know, and yeah. that it doesn't have to be one way or the other. Well, it's just likely that whatever model you're trying to fit people into, and then you can't, and then you so subsequently you just ignore, 
suggests that your model has flaws. Yeah. And so, so like the training thing, like, okay, Ray squats once a week and got strong. Like best squat in the world. Well, if your thing is like, well, he's not doing enough volume to get strong. Like, how is this possible? And it's like, well, maybe it's just not about volume. You know, uh, simple, you know, so, and maybe, yeah, sure. Maybe he's super training sensitive and responds super well to the stuff. But all it's saying is that your simplistic thought about frequency and volume is incomplete. Yeah. There's more stuff going in there. And so if you took in all of these other factors that actually contribute to the outcome, then maybe you'd say, oh, well, yeah, that makes sense. You know, he's got, if it's an equalizer and volume is just one of the, the dial, a 10 band equalizer, and it's just one of the dials. Well, maybe there's four or five other ones that you're not thinking about. And he's got those all jacked up to 11. And uh, that's why he gets, I mean, what? I'm just jealous. I have to squat more than him to squat less. Like, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, and, I mean, I, I'm, this should go without saying, you know, but I mean, it's, it, it absolutely doesn't take anything away from, what raised them, you know, that, oh, yeah. I mean, how could it, right? Like you have somebody who's excelling in, in the sport, you know, and, and, and I think that's interesting too, just that there's a uh, kind of a cultural component that um, kind of the suffering Olympics, you know, like we, oh, yeah, <laughs> like I do more training volume. I'm, I'm more beat up than you. I'm, you know, I rest less. I, whatever, you know, sure. Train yeah, hurt, train. Better. No yeah. days off. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's... Man, it, it... Like, there's a... Like, the idea of keeping the goal the goal is important and so often missed, I think. Yeah. Like, uh, the goal of powerlifting is to lift the most weights in the powerlifts. And, like, this idea kind of creeps in in a lot of weird ways. Like, there's the you know, people who over fixate on, on volume or on whatever. But then there's also like, I talk a lot about emerging strategies and there's a, a focus on assistance exercises and a lot of the, the stuff that I talk about, although not, it doesn't necessarily have to be that way. Anyway, um, people sometimes want to measure like how long is it taking me to peak on front squats or on pause squats or things like that. And it's like, whoa, whoa, that's, that's not the goal. Sure. You keep the goal, a goal and not yeah. get sidetracked by these other things. The only reason that those things are important is if they influence the goal. Yeah. That's yeah. We were talking, Austin and I were talking about that on a podcast not too long ago. We were saying like, we all, we always got pissed whenever like we'd PR on like a, like a, a supplemental squat or deadlift. Like you'd have like this wild PR and you're like, damn, I guess I was strong today. I should have like pulled a single. <laughs> like, like, uh, I remember one week. So my best deadlift ever is 725, right? And so, uh, but I, I, on a two count pause deadlift, I did a triple at 655, no belt. So, and I remember after I did it, I was like, damn it. I should have <laughs> like, I should have just, you know, worked up to a heavy single today on a regular deadlift because that's the goal. The yeah. goal is not how much I can pause for a triple. The goal is, can I pull 730 at some point in my life before I die? Like that's, <laughs> yeah. well now, you know. but uh, so anyway, yeah, it's just, that's interesting. It, well, at least it happens to you too. You don't have to like, yeah. not just me. Well, and, and I think it's, uh, I don't know, wouldn't it be interesting if there was a way to systematize that type of flexibility, you know, so that you could, because I think a lot, what a lot of it boils down to is is giving people permission, you know, like, is there a way that you could systematize it so that, you know, hey, you're working up, you know, and you're, so there's some cue that triggers like, hey, actually, you are having a good day today. And since that's the goal for you, you know, hey, you're, you're clear, clear, hot, YOLO, yeah, today, yeah. you know, come on in. <laughs> Yeah. Whereas, you know, somebody else, maybe the goal is different. And if the, if the goal is, is not, you know, lifetime PR seeking, if the goal is, you know, specific competition or something like that, then, you know, you've got to temper things a, a bit more, but see, so that's, that's another part of this. And I'm going to end up tangenting here all night, I think, but, uh, Good. yeah, I don't keep going. <laughs> it's like, uh, people that want to over conclude, 
uh, training truths from national systems. The national system isn't the goal. Of the national system isn't for you to set a lifetime PR. The goal of the national system is to produce national competitors. Uh, the goal of a powerlifting system is to generate powerlifting totals. You know, uh, presumably at least uh, to. <laughs> To it's develop great. you for a powerlifting competition, right? And if that's not the goal, then if if the goal is something else like a, like a lifetime PR, th- those are close. Those are very closely related, and you can probably uh, derive some really useful information from those those two things. But it's not the same thing, right? Nope. Keep it's, the goal the goal. I like that. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Well, man, I've taken up more than my fair share of your time, but I appreciate it. This is a good conversation. Yeah, all good. Hopefully your listeners, viewers, whoever found this useful. Uh, I'm sure. Everybody knows where to find me. Give me a good intro. Yeah. Just give me a good intro. Like, that's, that's all I want. You can, say, you can talk about how handsome I am, whatever you want. You know, just... No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> no, <all right. laughs> no, I'm sure thing, but... Uh, I think a lot of times at the end, you may have convinced some people that you're worth listening to. Oh, sure. <laughs> uh, so okay. we already mentioned the Barbell Medicine podcast. Yeah. Uh, so you can where else us. do you like to talk to people? Sure. So you can find us. Yeah, we're on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, all under Barbell Medicine. So if you want to watch or listen or both, those that's where to find us. Our website, barbellmedicine.com. Uh, Instagram, uh, myself and uh, Dr. Baraki also post a lot of stuff pertaining to all of these issues on the regular. So it's Jordan underscore Barbell Medicine or Austin underscore Barbell Medicine. If you're super geeked out on science, two of our pain rehab specialists, Mike, uh, Michael Ray and Derek Miles, they're Mike and Derek underscore Barbell Medicine respectively. Uh, so yeah, if you just type in Barbell Medicine, you're going to find a whole bunch of stuff. Hope Nothing bad yet. I like keep Googling because I'm waiting for like something bad to come up, but like we're okay. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thanks again for your time. It's good talking with you. Yeah, man. We'll talk soon. Reactive Training Systems. <laughs>